what I want to emphasize is the fact that when people see SEEK as a department, people have no idea what SEEK is. So if I talk about SEEK, I'm gonna explain of course what it is, but does anyone here know what SEEK is? Have you ever heard about it? No, anyone here from New York? Okay, have you heard about yeah. SEEK? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, now, um, being myself a first generation college student, the first one to go to college from my family, the only one that speaks English in my immediate family, no one, mama, mama, no mi, mama, mi papa, no mis hermanos, hablan English, only me, I'm the only English speaking person. So, what I valued as a college student, the kind of support that I valued as a college student, I realized that many other students like myself coming from low-income families, first-generation college students, uh, valued, and I wanted to make sure that I provide others with the kind of support that I needed when I was a college student. So throughout my long 30-something years in education, believe it or not, okay, I've worked as faculty, but also uh, on a lot of grant proposals, a lot of grant projects, and for the last seven years as the chair and the director of the SEEK department at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Now, I'm not gonna read all of this, but I do wanna let you know that, or I want you to be informed, because I get this a lot, that we are an equal opportunity program, okay? That many uh, states uh, through other countries have something similar, different names, okay? but ours is Search for Education, Elevation, and Knowledge, and it became a law in 1966. So we are state-funded because we are an item on that uh, state budget, and we have a certain, well, we are given an allocation, so we are not able to accommodate all the students that we would like to serve, okay? I can, only admit on an annual basis uh, a certain amount of students that fluctuate between 250, well, basically 200 and 250 students. Okay. Now, what, and it was a lot clearer there than it's here, but what I always tell my audience, uh, especially educators, administrators, is that the purpose of our program is to mitigate the inequity of educational systems. Okay, um, because it's not only committed to access, which we hear a lot, but problem, the problems that a lot of our uh, colleges and institutions face, not getting them in, okay, is getting them out with a diploma, okay? Because many come in through one door, but they leave so uh, when I was charged with overseeing this, uh, this program, I made it my life mission, <laughs> okay, to increase the amount of students that left with a diploma, okay? And to do that, I needed to work on a lot of restructuring and a lot of planning. 64% of our Sikh students Okay, at John Jay are Hispanic. College-wide, we have over 43%, so that we are an HSI. We have over 43% of Hispanic Latino students, and my department in particular has 64%. So just for you to get an idea how our students come in terms of college preparation versus the regular admitted students, uh, our students are, of, of course, their uh, admission standards are lower, uh, their SATs are lower, and the CP is 785, 786. Uh, other programs within CUNY, we are an institution with uh, many other campuses, they, some of them are higher, some of them are more or less, clear, but we are among those that are lower in terms of uh, GPAs and SATs. So this is the SAT, and this is the GPA. <clears throat> now, 
understanding our student profile and what they're struggling with or what their needs are, very important when I took on the role of chair and director. I'm the chair of the department and the director of the program. So I wear two hats and then when I teach one of the classes and three hats, okay? Uh, so the reason why we're both a department and a program is because I have faculty that teach courses. So that makes it a department, we offer courses. And then the support system that we have in place, academic support, counseling, all that makes it a program. So I have both a department and a program. So I'm going to share mostly what has been done in the first, I took on the position in 2011. The first year was a lot of assessment and I developed a plan. Of course with my team, we don't do this alone. And these were some of, it was a long plan, but I'm not gonna share that with you. I'm just gonna highlight some of the things that we thought we needed to do. We needed to align and implement a sh some short and long-term plans, and that includes goals and objectives, right? We need to know, okay, this is where we are uh, at the end of the semester, at the end of this year, at the end of two years, three years, this is where we wanna be, right? So we had our short and long-term planning. We needed to assess. Uh, my department was not used to a lot of assessment. So the first thing I asked was, do you have an assessment plan? And I had no idea what I was talking about, okay? Uh, because I've been involved in grants for a long time and for you to get money, <laughs> no matter what money you want to go after, you have to assess. There is expected outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, since the program did not have to resubmit, like when you are, like when I was a Title V director, for those of you that have done Title III, Title V, you know you have these performance reports. Uh, so I was used to that. But for them, because they get this money, because it's a law, uh, they didn't have to resubmit applications or grant proposals to get the funding. So there was not a lot of assessment. So I started asking, so how do you know what's working? How do you know what's not working? How do you know what we need to keep and what we need to change? So that was a difficult conversation because many of them we're okay with the status quo, which our students were failing and not graduating or leaving and, you know. Well, they, don't, they were not okay, but they just didn't know how to identify, you know, what the needs were and how we were gonna address them. So I established ongoing assessment, accountability process. I started an assessment team because I needed to have a group of people that could work with me, okay? Um, and then I realized that there was, some kind of a gap or was a mismatch between the department goals and mission and the college goals and mission. You know, our logo is educating for justice, right? That's what we're known for, for justice. Not only criminal justice, but social justice. A lot of people know John Jay for the criminal justice piece of it, but it's not only about criminal justice, it's about social justice also. But I thought it was important for us to revise our mission and I'll share what that mission is now. When I first looked at the mission, I'm like, this is so boring. I don't know, you know who are we talking to and what we're actually saying. So what part of it was that the focus was on what our students lacked. Everything was underprepared, underprivileged, underrepresented. Everything was very, you know, it's so negative. Okay, and I'm like, no, oh, our students already feel marginalized. Our students, there's already a stigma for being part of this program because they know when they come in, you were not admitted into the regular program. Okay? You're going through this like little side entrance and they already felt, okay, that they were stigmatized. So I wanted to change that language and I needed to move from remediation to lifelong learning, that's why the title is setting them up, not for them to complete their first year, their second year, from, not only for them to go from remediation to college level, but for them to continue. Okay? And restructure services, money was coming in for student initiatives, 
for certain support, but we were not really looking into how those resources were impacting our students, what kind of impact they were having. Okay? So we had to also restructure some of those services and how those uh, resources were used. And we needed to work with curriculum and specific populations and targeted interventions. Like, it's not the same for you to, if you're a transfer student and come in from a community college, the prescription is gonna be different than if you started, or you're just coming straight from high school. So that needed to be addressed. Is I don't put everyone, you know, I'm saying because they are different populations. It's not the same if you are a commuter student, you know, that come from upstate New York than if you live in the city. Right? There were different groups, different types of populations. We needed to develop targeted interventions. So we came up with this vision and mission. The first part is mostly the vision and then the mission. So what, what we want, you know, what's our vision? Is to promote, maintain, and graduate individual who strive to further their education and professional success within a social justice framework. Right? That's what John Jay is. So we wanted students that completed our programs to become those agents, uh, those advocates for justice. So we're committed to elevating, cultivating, and empowering such individuals by way of academic support. That's one of the things that we provide as part of the program they get we get funded to provide academic support. Students get financial aid as part of their package. Counseling, they are assigned counselors, and we offer them courses. They have a freshman seminar course that all of our students are required to take. Besides, we have map designated sections from, you know, uh, that are for our students, English designated sections. We work with learning communities, and we also just develop a new gen ed class for, that was just taught this past semester for transfer students. So advocates, positive social change. That's what, I left the clicker and I'm like, what am I doing? Okay. So, I already mentioned ongoing assessment. Here's a, the font is smaller because there was a lot of things I wanted to put here, but. Uh, I mentioned the revision of the mission statement, moving from remediation to graduation. Nowhere in that mission statement am I talking about disadvantaged students, underrepresented, underprivileged, uh, no, nowhere there, right? You know, leave that for somewhere else. If we're going after money, we use some of those terms, right? But we already have the money. Okay. Uh, so we focus from remediation to graduation. We restructure our services, the academic support uh, when I took on the, the department and the program, there was this like a room smaller than probably half the size, maybe four, three fourths, a little smaller than this. Uh, that was supposed to be our academic support or tutoring center, and I had a problem with that because there it was so crowded, and we offered tutoring uh, for every subject. And I knew that students were really struggling with math. I wanted math to be a separate center. So after a lot, for those of you that, you know, work in an institution that you're tight in space, like, you know, real estate is prime and you can't get anything, right? Or you have to split with another program, with another department, or put a little cubicle somewhere. Uh, so it took a while for me to get the attention of uh, the higher administration to give me another center. And I divided it into two centers. So the math and science uh, tutors, which we don't call tutors anymore because our students thought tutoring was for stupid kids. Right? So we changed it. Okay, we don't call tutoring. We call them academic support and we call our tutors learning facilitators. Okay, so we changed the whole language there. So we have now a math and science center and we have a humanities and social science center. So math and science have their own. We offer degrees in forensic science in it. So knowing that science and math were crucial for students that needed the support. And we have a lot of students that unfortunately were always turned down for getting into those programs because they did not have the math and science skills. And I thought they should have been given the chance to you know, get into those programs. So we have the math and science center with 
very, very well-trained professionals in math and science, and then the humanities and social sciences, the teach, and, you know, the tutors there or the facilitators work with them from the basic uh, English courses, composition, all the way to uh, uh, law, our pre-law program, and so forth. Counseling, we lower the caseloads. Okay. Our students are required to see their counselors, especially freshman students, have to see their counselors at least three times a semester. Okay, as freshmen, three times is a must. And then as they move on, you know, may be less, but three times as a freshman. And, and but the caseloads at the time, you know, were pretty large. So our counselors sometimes couldn't see the students three times a semester as required. So we had to lower the caseloads. We integrated counseling into some of the workshops and the courses that we offered, okay? So it was integrated into the curriculum. We knew that we couldn't get any more staff, because of course these, we have these, the budget is set, we couldn't recruit, so we welcomed graduate interns, all right? Since we couldn't go out and hire more counselors, we were able to get social work interns that were interested in working with our student population. And I have a um, retired social worker who was dean of a social work program in Col at Columbia, so she knew what she was doing, uh, to oversee our intern program. And we recruit them, all, or we welcome them, we don't recruit them, they're as part of their uh, program, to come and do their <coughs> internship hours with us. So that helps us develop different kinds of interventions and programming for specific groups. We then have transfers, we have sophomores, we have academic probation uh, interventions, and we have many others, but these are the ones that a lot of our interns help us with. Okay, they see students in small groups, they run workshops, and so forth. Then our summer academy, which is a required part of the program, and I'm gonna break it a little further because uh, a lot of the success that I'm gonna share with you is due to our summer academy. And then a peer mentoring program, which of course took a while for us to get the funded, funding for because that it was not part of the program, so we had to write one of these uh, small grants to pilot it and uh, assess it. It was very successful, so we institutionalized. And then the targeted outreach and communication. When we talk about communication, we realize a lot of you probably can relate to this. You send emails and students don't respond. Or they never check their institution email because they have their personal emails. So we developed a strategy with the associate uh, director for her to have targeted groups and send communication for specific events or specific interventions to different groups and not send a mass email. We did work a lot on that kind of communication. Students that applied for SEEK, or marked SEEK in their CUNY application, they were coming into the program and they had no idea what they were signing up for. They, they, somewhere, they, someone told them, you know, when you apply, apply to SEEK, there's money there. Okay, they check this money, everybody's gonna sign off, you know, you're gonna get this, you're gonna get that. So they would mark it, you know. And when they came, and we would ask them, so why were you interested in being part of the program? Many of them had no idea. And the parents either, okay? So we have these mandatory information sessions for incoming students. Once the student meets the requirements, and we know the student will be you know, a possible candidate for uh, our incoming freshman class, we send them an invitation. And we uh, now, for the last, I think, four years, we have been running bilingual sessions for parents uh, in English and Spanish. So uh, I have, my colleague does the English part and I do the Spanish one. And then what the Summer Academy, which I'm gonna break it in one separate slide does, is work with students during that first of, well, that's their first experience, their first college experience is, is the Summer Academy. 
Then the first semester, students take a freshman three credit seminar, which was also revised, which was also, is taught also by the counselor, the same counselor that they are required to see every semester, the counselor they're assigned for their whole college experience of college life, becomes the first instructor these students see. Okay, well, not necessarily the first one, but within the first experience of the semester, because that instructor is their counselor who teaches the freshman seminar class. And it's a three credit seminar class, and it's part of our gen ed. It's not like a fresh, like a zero credit or one credit, uh, I know other institutions have, or just a workshop. No, ours is part of our gen ed. All of our students have to take a freshman seminar. And then having it taught by their counselor, having a manageable amount of students, which also I worked on, it was 35, it got it to 22, and then developing learning communities with either their English or their math or any of their other courses that they're taking during the freshman is a, not all of the students are part of the learning communities because of scheduling, but we do have groups of learning communities. And then Seek Fest is like an info session after they're already, the info session for the summer for the incoming students is more about what Seek is all about. They get to meet other students, especially their peer mentors. Uh, they get to ask questions. It's, it's small groups, not auditorium type. That was the prior setting. It was a big, you know, room, and we just said, oh, this is what Seek is, this is what you get, this is a, okay, we restructure that, and they, I welcome them in a large group, and they then move into smaller groups with a peer mentor, a learning facilitator, and a counselor, or a faculty member. And then, the first semester in October, you know, we talk about Harvest Fest, right? And in the States, we talk about Harvest Fest, uh, so we call it Seek Fest. It's a way of reconnecting with the students during the fall and finding out how they're doing and at the same time moving them on into, okay, now that you've already started, now that you've been here for two months or for a month and a half, these are the other things that you should be thinking about. Study abroad, student clubs, athletics, all of them. Uh, and, and what's different between this approach and other approaches in the past were that all some of these programs in the past used to do was getting them out of remediation. That was the focus. It was just, okay, you have to pass math, you have to pass English. Uh, oh, you know, you can't move on to the next because your placement was this low, so all you have to do is go to tutoring and this is, no, that's why we wanted it to be holistic, to be comprehensive, for us to touch on every aspect of your student life. So the Summer Academy, which has been a success, God, after all the work we've done, the students are placed in the summer course, right, based on how they scored, of course, in their placement exam. It could be a developmental course, right, remedial, developmental, or it can be, if the students do not need any type of remediation, in an English or math and sometimes we have other courses, computer literacy, and we've also had communications. And, uh, so we have a, group, a number of courses that we offer students during the summer for them to get a head start. That first experience, that first college experience, their first class, we want it to be during the summer uh, because one class would give them that exposure and at the same time, they would feel like, hey, if I can do one, I can do two, I can do three, right? Okay, uh, the way it's structured, they have the course in the morning, and then in that, we have a supplemental instructor that sits in that course. We have the professor, the instructor, we have a supplemental instructor that sits in the course, and then we have a peer mentor. The peer mentor doesn't necessarily have to sit in the course, but the peer mentor is going to do some co-curricular activities with them. Then technology, how do we integrate technology? Uh, this has been uh, a work in progress. We still are working on some of this. For this semester, for this past summer, our students were introduced to e-portfolios. Uh, how many of you use e-portfolios? Electronic portfolios? No, 
Okay, so our students, because of the way technology is moving and how important it is for students to, um, to use technology, we wanted to, and the college was already, all the other students were starting to build portfolios, and I never want to leave our students behind. So I'm like, wait a minute, all these other programs are doing it, and our students, I don't want them to lack of anything, right? I don't want them to miss anything. We introduced the ePortfolio. The platform that we're using is Digication. For those of you that are interested in using ePortfolio, there are a lot of, uh, of um, programs out there. Uh, we currently use Digication. There are some that are better, there are some that are worse, there are some that are less expensive, there are some that are more expensive. I've been using technology for a long time, and I think this is okay. Okay, I'm very honest, but it's okay, it's, it's good. Uh, then for Alex, if the students come with all of these, you know, issues with math and all these, you know, they were lacking in, 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 in terms of concepts and skills, and we don't want to give them what they, this, use the same strategies that they were exposed to in high school, because it wasn't working for them. Right, so if something doesn't work, you have to change it. Because if you keep doing it, you know how it goes, right? You're going to keep getting the same results. So we piloted a few different types of software. We um, did some with Pearson. We did some with different publishers, with different companies. Until finally, we actually, McGraw-Hill has Alex. And we piloted it, and we got better results. So we went from a pilot to actually the last uh, Four years, we started in, yeah, thir the last three years. Uh, this is what has worked best for our students, where they complete these modules, and the faculty, the professor, uses the technology to reinforce the skills, and the students go back to the module that they have not mastered, and it's individualized. So whatever this student didn't get, the first time he could go back to the module, he has his own account, work on that skill, and it's also easier for us to move our resources, our academic resources and learning facilitators, because we already know what they're struggling with when we get those results. So it's better to tailor or customize the intervention for the students based on the results. So instead of putting all of the students believing that one size fits all, and it doesn't, right? We use the technology for the students to work individually and then to customize what the instructor and the learning facilitator uh, does. The learning facilitator during the summer is the same supplemental instructor that sits in the class. So that instructor is there with usually graduate students. Uh, some of them have already graduated uh, and they are there during the regular you know, portion of the course, and then the students work afterwards with the technology and they're there as well. So that has worked. The college readiness modules, we develop modules that the peer mentors, every week during the summer, they have a theme. We have a weekly theme. So we have financial literacy. A lot of students, that, especially those that come from backgrounds that they, it's probably the first time they get a check, right? So they get this money for, you know, for books or the stipends for different things. They don't know what they're gonna do with the money. Right? And many times they misuse the money. So we start with financial literacy, helping them set up a bank account, giving them information about what tuition, how tuition works, how much they have to set aside for transportation, the time that they're gonna be in school. Because you get a check at the beginning of the semester, if you don't use it wisely, you're, not, you're gonna be out of money and you won't be able to commute. And our students are commuters. They come in, tr most of them, public transportation, trains and buses. So, financial literacy, college life, okay? We introduce them to everything related to college life and uh, we've already done a little bit of that in the info session, but now we go more, I mean, in the info session at the beginning, but now during the summer, we have a whole week to talk about college life and student organizations and student clubs. Technology, they are really familiar with social media, 
but very little knowledge on how to use academic resources online or what kind, what, how can technology work for them in college, right? So there was a whole module, this one I developed on technology and how to use technology, what, how, why is it important for them to um, use the college email, why they have to work on education, why they, how can they access Blackboard, so a whole module on technology, and then networking. Okay, it's important for them to network with other students, with, uh, with their peers, with their professors, with uh, student life, and so forth. And all of these modules are facilitated by peer mentors. So there is a team in place. Okay? They have the instructor. They have the supplemental instructor. They have the facilitators at the center. They have a peer mentor. This team, okay, they meet on a regular basis. They collaborate. We have a coordinator that oversees the peer mentors. And um, they are held accountable, that team, for the success of that group that is starting their first semester, okay, or their first college experience in the summer program. The academic support is mandatory. So the centers are open, but the, during the summer, it's not an option. It's not if you need help, it's you have to go to academic support. So most of our courses during the summer, the academic support is either in the same classroom, you have the the learning facilitators come to the classroom, or if they're working on technology like the Alex module, then they will escort them to the labs and be there with the students to make sure that students get the academic support because it's intense. It's a four and a half weeks. They have to complete a course. And it's, as you know, uh, courses of state, well, I believe it's the same here in Puerto Rico. It should be 45 of instructional hours, right? So we need to do the same during the summer. Okay, so what has also changed and what we think has also helped students look at education beyond just access, right? And the team that works with me is to engage students throughout every experience. So we have now a transfer experience, we have a sophomore experience, we're losing students after the sophomore year. So we had to go after those students. So freshman students, they start already, we prepare them already as student leaders since they come in on how are you going to be held accountable for your peer sophomore year. And they started a sophomore experience with the students, okay, with two of the counselors leading them, right, and guiding them. Flags Peer Mentoring, that's our peer mentoring program, which is furthering leadership, academic growth, and success. And power is Pushing our will, now if I remember what the other two words, resilience, I know it's resilience. It's for our men of color, this is new, for our men of color, okay, enduring resilience. And then we have our student club. So all of this and Chi Alpha Epsilon for students that maintain a 3.0 or above, which is like our honor club. So, results. Okay, first year retention, because of all of the support that we've had in place, have always been a little higher, okay, than for the non seek students, because we do have a support system in place, right? But it was the gap, right? It, it, I mean, we can see that although we were higher in first year retention in 2011, we have increased our retention while the non seek students' retention has decreased, and that's something the college is working on. Our Hispanic students, as I said, we have over 64% of Hispanic students, and this is significant. Now, why do you think our first year retention for Hispanic students is so much higher than the non seek students? Anybody? Any guesses? Any ideas? <laughs> you just took a picture. I'm going to put yeah, it on our course. website. <laughs> we'll put it on our website. When I talk about Hispanic students, I like my institution.
happen to know I always bring them up. Okay. Now, who do you think a lot of these peer mentors are? Many of them are Hispanic students. A lot of facilitators are, okay? A lot of the clubs that are organized and all of these initiatives, doesn't mean they're only Hispanic students because I have to serve all of my students, okay? But many of my student leaders have given them the opportunity of them, for them to give back to the program, okay? Give back, right? And that sense of giving back for Hispanic students, they take it very seriously, okay? It's not about me. It's about my people, okay? And, and that's what many people, um, especially uh, some administrators don't get when I talk to them about, you know, giving these students a leadership opportunity. And many of them, all they look at are SATs and GPAs. And I said, no, no, let's work with those students, even those that are struggling. We've had students on academic probation, okay? Academic probation below 2.0, we've developed an intervention for them, right? They have become honor students, and now they run the academic probation groups because we gave them an opportunity, okay? And these students are genuinely, you know, invested in giving back to the program. And the majority of them are Hispanic students. Our math, right, it was so bad. It was so bad. I am telling you, when we had to dismiss students, when we had to dismiss students because they were not passing their math course, their gateway math course, it would break my heart. Every time I had to sit you know, through this review committee, and they were so and so, nope, out. And I'm like, we have to do something. So all of these initiatives, you know, the, the students, the center, uh, better training, better trained professionals in math and science, using Alex, uh, using the supplemental instructor in small groups, all of this, have we now, okay, and I got the data, the most recent data recently, okay, and we're in this more or less the same, okay, it's just if it's not available institutionally, if the IR, you know, the institutional research uh, review committee doesn't have it, I can't share until I get the final results. But <coughs> the composition the same. First year composition pass rate, our English 101 class, we were, the pass rate was in the 70, low 70s and 70. Now we're in the 90s. And you know that students that do not pass, and I imagine it's in most institutions of higher ed, you don't pass your intro composition or English 101 class, your composition is very, very hard for you to move on to any courses because many of them is a prerequisite for other courses. So we needed to work with those basic courses for them to move ahead. That was why we were not retaining them, because if they didn't pass math and English, there was nothing else for them to take. They couldn't move on to any of their courses in the major. Our second year retention. So it's not a first year phenomenon here. It's not that it worked only first year. We are seeing the results beyond the first year. Our second year retention. And the institution is now coming to us, okay? What are you guys doing? So I have this chance and share the best practices with the rest of the college. Now, I wait a minute, you know, you can't have 300 students for one counselor. Not gonna work, okay? Another thing, the average credits earned, our students were not accumulating enough credits to move on, right? And we've increased the amount of credit students because they were feeling many times that they couldn't handle the coursework. And they are required to take at least 12 credits for them to be part of the program. And they have to be full-time students. We cannot support part-time students. It's against you know, the requirements, the policy. So I want to leave you with this, right? What about your programs? You know, are you achieving your mission? 
and I like to reflect on these things because uh, I had to do that as I, you know, restructure our program uh, and as develop a plan. And a plan on paper is just paper. I needed to act on that plan. Okay, so. I don't know where you are in terms of transformation, uh, in terms of you know, how satisfied you are with what your students are accomplishing and how far the institution is going, but I always like to reflect on this every year 